This is the Tough Hub, a show brought to you by Tough Africa Global to educate you on real estate matters, to mentor you and inspire you. After 48 years of working and also traveling all over the world, I am ready to share my experience with you, especially those young ones who follow me for inspiration. welcome you to our first, second and third session. We're starting our sessions proper. As I said in the dispatch, we are running out of time and would want to finish by December, January, inshallah. I just want to remind all of us present here, especially we the youth, that we're in elections year, elections time, sorry, and we should come out in our large numbers and vote come May 20th. Not just to vote, but to vote wisely. We should always put into our minds that voting is a national decision-making process. And I'd always say it is one of the most, decision, the most important decisions we take in our lives. Because it is when, we, when our voices are heard, it is when we exercise our franchise. So I advise us to vote wisely as Gambia is our Gambia and we the youth are the leaders now. Um, thank you for coming and welcome to our sessions proper. I'll pass on the microphone to Mr. Njai to welcome our guest. Thank you. So today we're going to have um, uh, Mr. Usain Ngom who's going to speak on, on integrity. On a short introduction, I want to introduce Alaji Usain Ngom or Mr. Usain Ngom, who will tell you who he is. Uh, but we don't normally do any formal introduction. He will briefly tell you who he is and why he is here. But he's a man of, of, of wealth of experience. You know, retired now, but not tired, doing his own thing. But he will tell you what he has done. And then from there, I hope before he finishes, we'll have the other speakers here. So, Alaji Usainu, welcome to the podium. Let's give him a round of applause. My name is Mr. Usain Ngom. Uh, I am an accountant by profession. I am a trained chartered accountant. But uh, I haven't worked in accounts for over 25 years now because I started working in social transformation. And that took me into so many spheres of life, international development, uh, human equity, uh, gender equity, and issues of uh, social justice in particular. Now, my task today is to speak to you about integrity. Integrity as a, personal fee as, a, as a feature for the nation and integrity as a feature for its citizens. I mean, Burkina Faso took it even further because the, 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 the country Burkina Faso itself is called the nation of people with integrity. That's what it means. You know, in French, uh, le pays uh, des hommes intègres. Uh, if you translate that, it's, it's the nation with people of integrity. Now, if you move on to a nation like Rwanda, or a nation like Singapore, or a nation like the United Arab Emirates, they have designed their nations based on integrity in everything they do. Integrity in their systems, integrity in their govern govern government governance mechanisms, integrity in their interactions, but more particularly to instill that notion of integrity into their citizens. That if you operate as a person of integrity, you seek to build a nation. But this is individual. It has to be you yourself making a decision that I am going to be a person whose primary motion in life centers around integrity. And what that then means is that it's a responsibility you take on personally. Let me situate the notion of integrity in that sphere. That when you actually inculcate those values in yourselves, in a society, at a domestic level, at a national level, at an international level, it translates into something. Because when you walk into some of these nations and you're doing business, 
You're not bothered by the lack of fairness. You're not bothered by the lack of transparency. You're not bothered by issues of corruption. But these are all being delivered by humans like you and I. The difference is they have taken personal responsibility to ensure that in every interaction, it is underpinned by integrity. So that you walk away feeling confident that what you are seeking has been given to the person's best ability. Now, how do you seek to get there? There is no, there is no prescription as to how you become a person of integrity. But there are manifestations that will indicate that you are likely to have integrity if you follow some of these manifestations and some of these values. For example, if you are principled, if you are a person who has principle, if you are a person who has character, you know, you are recognizable. People know that this is a man of character. He keeps his word, things like that. You know, an image. You portray an image of seriousness. You know, so for example, if I gave you a commitment that I will be here at 10, and I turn up at midday, and I don't apologize, and seek to explain why I am late, then, you know, you begin to question how serious I take what I say, for example. You know, open oneness. You know, making sure that everything in our society is accessible to everyone. So every Gambian feels able and capable to access anything that this nation offers, being offices, being services. You know, as a Gambian, you feel, by virtue of being a citizen, you have access. Uh, commitment. I mean, being committed to a particular cause <coughs> or a particular task and doing it in the way it is expected will sort of take you to a place where people will feel you have integrity. I mean, and being compliant. If you're a person of integrity, you always portray your reality. Because, you know, you, you want people to aspire or to espouse what you do. So, for example, you know, you're in, uh, in, 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 in Taft's cohort. Taft's way of doing that is to show, for example, he calls it real estate life, to demonstrate how his daily life works. And in, in that process, he speaks about his challenges and his successes. So that people don't have a utopic view of what he does or, or how he does it, but have a realistic view. Now, in our world today, that is quite a difficult task because, you know, you even have people hiring image consultants so that their images are managed to respond to what people expect as opposed to what their reality is. Now, this is a major challenge because, you know, it, it creates uh, dynamics that we don't expect. A classic example of that is Donald Trump, the former U.S. president. Donald Trump portrayed an image that was quite popular based on populism. The next one is... Uh, trying to make the right decisions, even if you're under pressure. Again, there is a cultural distortion in our nation today that is linked to trying to make decisions that are not real, but they're just decisions to respond to a social demand. When you have values of integrity, these are all issues you, you, you reflect on to make sure that what you're doing, you fully understand and you're doing it because it makes sense and that is what is expected. Now, being predictable. For example, if I take an issue to a person, if they're a person of integrity, you can almost certainly predict which way they're going to go. What decision are they going to make? Often, if there are people who have integrity, it will be the right decision, it will be a fair decision, and it will be a transparent decision. It is a decision that they will be able to explain. You may not agree with it, you may not be happy about it, but at least they would have given you the basis on which they arrived at that decision. So they are predictable. They are also reliable. And their reliability comes from that predictability. So often when there are problems in society, most of the people in society will gravitate towards certain people or certain institutions. And the reason for that is because they expect fairness. They know these are predictable institutions. These are predictable people. You can go to them. You can tell them any issue. They will make a decision that is fair, that is right. So they, have you, they give you that predictability and that reliability. Also, in the, in the um, context of a nation, 
you want to ensure that laws are applied and laws are applied consistently. Now that again is, is a responsibility of us because these laws, they don't apply themselves. They are applied by people who are appointed into offices. So if you don't carry these values into those offices, you're not likely to deliver them. And that is what makes it personal to each and every one of us to say, look, I am going to be a person of integrity. I am going to be a person that is predictable. So if the law says this is what should be done, it should not be rocket science. You should be able to apply those laws consistently and fairly. Of course, uh, it, it, the laws will have guidance. And that is what our lawyer friends are paid for, to determine whether you followed those rules or you did follow those rules, you broke the rules. But ultimately, it will be argued around application of the law as it is prescribed. But these are all dependent on us as individuals, as human beings, taking on these responsibilities and delivering them with integrity. And that is the expectation, that if, if you are able to do that, then we are getting there. Now, the issue of character. Now, characters are recognizable. For example, if you take things like the number one, two, three, ABC, these are very recognizable. And this is the same with human beings. If you have character, people will recognize it. If you do not have character, people will recognize it. Now, if you, if you look at uh, the world we live in today, the global space we live in today, those sorts of attributes and those sorts of qualities only happen in roughly about 12% of spaces or 12% of the time. So that's why you don't have a Rwanda everywhere. Or a, but what is significant is that individuals have, making, have taken a personal choice. They have taken a personal decision and they have said, this is the way I am going to portray myself, this is the way I am going to run my life, and this is what I am going to promote in my nation. And when you look at the results, all of the time, they deliver the same results. They deliver success, they deliver value, and they deliver aspiration. Because these are aspirational societies. You know, everybody now aspires to be like Singapore or a Dubai, and so on and so forth. And at a national level, there are one or two, three individuals in this country that many of us aspire to be like in a particular part of their life, in terms of their traits, in terms of their values, in terms of what they do. I'm sure there are many of you in the room who would one day wish to do what TAF is doing, contributing to society, helping the youth, giving them a window of opportunity, giving them hope, giving them a chance. Now, once you take on that responsibility, it, it has certain demands, it has certain expectations, one of which he explained earlier, being punctual, being disciplined, sticking to your commitment. You have committed to come here and do something from space X to space Y. So one of the main things that shows that you are responsible is you doing that regularly. And that's part of the image you portray, that if we build predictability, if we build integrity, then over time people will achieve what they're seeking to achieve. And this is why you have people working in areas of life that are not necessarily giving a daily financial benefit, but are giving another type of benefit. Now, our society is not yet that developed to get to that stage. But with, with, with setups like this, that is what you hope for. There are many of you who are motivated by social work, helping others, making other people, people feel good. Now, it's about how we reciprocate that to you as a society. How do we reward that? How do we recognize that? And, you know, in our nation, we have all the building blocks. For example, this country gives national awards. But very rarely do you see national awards that are given based on real social dimensions today. You know, in the olden days that happened, but now there is less of it. And there is more about a different type of recognition. And that, is not, that should not be our sole ambition in life. You need to motivate a society in a very parallel manner so that society is serving many things. Again, if you center yourself around values of integrity, these are all issues you take on. Because integrity is a whole. 
you know, it's a multidimensional concept. It looks at everything you do in life. So, for example, if you're driven by integrity, your journey in life is not going to be an I journey. It's going to be a we journey. And what do I mean by that? If you are a leader and you're, you're in a seat, position of high leadership, your ambition should be to create more like yourself. How many more leaders do I create? Not how many more people can I lead? So it, it's always about we. Because ultimately, whatever position you occupy, you're going to leave. And somebody else is going to come to occupy. So it behoves on you to create as many of you as is possible for whatever institution or whatever you are doing to be sustained. Now again, these are not issues that we spend a lot of time on. Instead, we, we turn it around and we admire the leader. So every day we sit is about praising the leader. It's not about making that leader take responsibility for driving something that other of, you know, some of us can ultimately come and drive. So again, these are things that we need to reflect on. And it's about responsibility. Those of us in positions of leadership need to be able to have that reflex. That actually, yes, amongst those around me, both in and out of my institution, I am going to be replaced by one of them. So my responsibility lies in making it known that this is what I do, this is how I do it. In my view, to do it well, this is what you do. In my view, this is not working well. And, you know, build that culture of openness, of shared values, you know, of good communication and so on. Um, and I remember I was watching the TRRC. And, you know, they were, they were, it's a scene that will never go out of my mind. They were torturing somebody. And then the call for prayer came. So they all left the person they were torturing and went to pray. And then came back and continued torturing the person. Now that, for me, is a demonstration of how much parts of our society has degenerated. Because that should not happen if you're being driven by, you know, your value of faith and your own belief system. So again, this is important for, for those of you in this room. Because you are going to take on positions of responsibility at, in, at a family level, at a work level, so on and so forth. And people expect you to bring out values that demonstrate that you are working with integrity. Now, <coughs> another value is one of, another one is one of commitment. Now, if you are committed to something, people are often committed to a cause. Now, the best global example to give is Nelson Mandela. He was committed to a cause which was to end apartheid. And for that, he himself said he was prepared to die and he was prepared to be... I mean, he did not mean that he was prepared to just go and be killed. But what he was saying is that I have a value for which I am willing to stand under any circumstance. And you know, the person who was listening to that on that particular day in 1963 actually sentenced him to life as opposed to death. Because, because he psychologically responded to Nelson's demand to be killed. He says, no, 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 I'm not going to kill you. I mean, this is the judge's own reflection. But again, these are personality traits that are at play. Because that particular judge, what he heard was that this is a man who's telling me, I have not done anything wrong. You just happen to be a position of power. And the question is, are you going to exercise this power fairly or unfairly? And on that particular day, that particular judge reached out to his conscience and decided that, no, I am going to do the right thing. I will sentence him to life, which is I will give myself a chance for there to be a conversation at a later stage. Now, that is because fundamentally there was some degree of integrity in that person, in that they were a high court judge, and they knew the law did not allow them to sentence that particular person to death for that particular crime. Even though that is what they were instructed, they didn't do it. Now, that does not happen often in our society. And uh, again, to, to give an example, just because it's a, it's a common discourse, I, I remember in the Jame days, we were very used to a, a term called executive directive. So executive directive substituted what was right. And I don't know of many of us as Gambians who stood up and said, well, 
I am going to do what is right. And I, I do understand the circumstances were different. It could cost you a life in a very crude way and so on. But when now we're in a space where the society is seeking to be much more fair, to be much more democratic, those of us who are coming along need to espouse these values. It needs to be worth something to us, just more than financial reward. Now, the values, the notions of equity and inclusiveness. And, and really, I want to spend a little bit of time on these two. Uh, <laughs> on these two, particularly inclusiveness. I mean, most of the societies that break down today break down because they are not inclusive. A good example to give you is the ongoing conflict in North Sudan. If you understand North Sudan, the lack of inclusiveness, the lack of equity in North Sudan has been manifesting itself progressively. It first started from a religious perspective, North and South Sudan. Power has always been vested in the North, and the North was predominantly Islamic and Arabized. So everybody who was slightly light-skinned and Muslim had an advantage. Everybody else didn't. It led to civil war and the South seceded. Then the West in Darfur, same lack of inclusion for ethnic reasons. And, and now, ultimately, for those in power, that lack of inclusiveness is manifesting in the military itself. Because, you know, the, the rapid response forms, uh, force is the, well, is the best equipped, the most well-armed in North Sudan. So now they have turned again their own, against their own masters because they're saying, well, you have enjoyed being in power for three years, now you want to hand over, we have not had our chance. So any, anything you are building that you want to be sustainable, you need to make sure it includes your entire society. It should not matter what religion people follow, what ethnic group they belong to, what level of education they have, how they see the world, what you want to do is to ensure that everybody has a chance to have a say, to contribute, and to benefit. And we're not all going to benefit in the same way. We're not all going to benefit in the same degree. But what matters is that we feel we're included and we have a chance. And once that happens, all our daily preoccupations will be about building that society. But if I feel I don't have a stick, I don't have a chance, then what will be my daily preoccupation? to break down that society. So inclusiveness is critical. And seeking to ensure that the laws, the provisions are equitable. Now, you are not going to be equitable 100%, but at the level of provision, at the level of making the laws, at the level of inviting society, portray equity. Give people the image that it is going to be equitable. And that the other bit about integrity is about compliance. Now, compliance in our case, in the Gambia, we have decided that we are going to have a constitutional republican society. So, we all need to adhere to and respect that constitution in all its, uh, in all its, uh, its, 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 its promises and expectations. And by that I mean all the Constitution guarantees us we must be allowed to have. And if we don't have, we should be able to ask for. And then again places a responsibility on us to understand that Constitution, to know what it says, because that is what guides our lives in this society. All of us sitting here, the only entitlement we have that is guaranteed in this nation is constitutionally guaranteed. It's what our Constitution says. That's what governs how we must behave how we must run our lives. And you know, these things are important because it guides us to operate our lives in a particular way so that we espouse integrity every time, every time we move. And uh, the next bit, and it's, it is the most interesting bit for Africa, is about power, power and integrity. Now, and this is where in our continent most of us fall down. Because once we are entrusted with power, power at a domestic level, whether we are a head of household, a husband, 
power as a head of an institution, power as a president, or in any of its forms, we, we, we manifest traits that are not helpful and traits that are often con conflictual. So, from your perspective, it's about the use of power. How do you use power? Now, when you lead, often your powers are prescribed. Whether it's an institution or a nation, there are laws that tell you how your powers should be exercised. But there's something else, that's the hard power. But there's something else called soft power. And soft power is about your personality. How you carry yourself, what you say, how you do it, how you guide people. You know, are you hitting the table all the time or are you, are you seeking to understand people? Again, these are all values around your own integrity as a person. How do I carry myself around? How do I invite people that I am leading? What relationships do I build as a result? And you know, if there are laws that, that guide how your power should be exercised, because say, if your office is term limited, well then you know, if I do my first five year term, my second year term, I should now be looking to ease myself out of power. Ease myself out of the role, bring somebody in. These are all values that integrity gives you. It makes you realize that life is a continuum. You know, you come in, you do your bit, you move out, somebody else comes in, does their bit. And that's what guarantees your kids survival, their kids survival. So what role do you have in that is to make it ready for them. Build that space. Make it possible for everybody to transition into the society and benefit and see their value. I hope this is helpful. Thank you. Thank you for watching the Tough Hop. Until we come your way on our next episode, subscribe, like, and share.